Hello, my name is John Pambolfino, and I'm a professor of medicine at the Feinberg School of Medicine, Northwestern University, and chief of the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Northwestern Medicine at Northwestern Memorial Hospital. Today, I'm going to be doing a talk on disorders of the throat and the esophagus and how we approach this. Now, esophageal symptoms, um, when you think about them, whether they're heartburn, which is a burning sensation in the chest, regurgitation, which is essentially bringing food up into your mouth, dysphagia, the sensation that food is not traveling through your esophagus, chest pain, or even getting a food impaction, your differential diagnosis in terms of what this could be is pretty vast. It could be reflux disease, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. It could be eosinophilic esophagitis, which is an allergic reaction in the esophagus. It could be an obstruction from either a stricture or injury and inflammation. Um, hopefully not a tumor, but certainly could be that, uh, although that is rare. It could be a motility disorder or a functional esophageal disorder, which may be related to either visceral hypersensitivity, sensing things at a physiologic level, or even just being hypervigilant to that particular symptom. Now, regardless of how patients present with these esophageal and throat conditions, all of our uh, workups really lead to endoscopy or visualization of the area to rule out mechanical obstructions, injury from reflux, and allergic reactions, especially in the esophagus. Now, that being said, if we see a negative test where the endoscopy is negative, which does happen quite often, then these are the patients who may have a motility disorder or a functional disorder or non-erosive reflux disease. And this is the standard um, diagnostic algorithm that we use for most of these esophageal symptoms. And as you can see, I don't want you to go through this part, but, but really what I want you to see is after we get the history and physical exams, at that particular point, we will always lead this uh, diagnostic approach to endoscopy, usually with biopsies or even laryngoscopy, looking in the throat with our ENT colleagues. And really when I go through this, that is really the starting point of my workup. When patients come in, I typically will treat most patients with these kind of symptoms with a proton pump inhibitor and I'll schedule them for endoscopy. And as I go down this list, this is what I'm looking for as I approach the patient, thinking about what could potentially go on in this particular patient. And then if there is the possibility of maybe some inflammation like esophagitis, a stricture, I will address those directly during the endoscopy. But as I mentioned, at least 50% of the time, the endoscopy is negative and we have to move on to further evaluation with esophageal function testing. And then of course, thinking about what the appropriate treatments are. Now, in terms of, as I mentioned, the, the idea, this is what esophagitis or a stricture would look like. You can see this inflammation sitting around the esophagus. Um, you can see this narrowing here. This is what we would see typically with pretty severe reflux disease. And if I saw this, I would know what you have. I would treat you with an escalation of anti-reflux therapy. Now, if I saw this, this is what an allergic reaction, eosinophilic esophagitis looks like in the esophagus. This is actually a piece of chicken. Um, that's stuck in the esophagus. And this is related to an eosinophilic. It's a specific allergic cell type that infiltrates the lining of the esophagus and creates a more stiff esophagus so food gets caught. So once again, if I see this, I'll know exactly how to treat this with acid medicines and then, of course, some anti-inflammatory agents that are typically topical steroids. And then sometimes I'll actually see these anatomical deformations like a hiatus hernia where the stomach is actually above the diaphragm. And then certainly I will think that maybe we need to treat this with a surgical remedy. But as I said before, many times these approaches show us that most people or 50% of the time, these people will have a normal endoscopy. And this is what a normal end of the esophagus looks like. This pearly white mucosa here, the lining is actually the the esophagus side, and then this salmon color below here is the stomach. And this is a nice intact squamoclumnar junction, which is the, the end of the esophagus and beginning of the stomach. And you can see here on the retroflect view where I'm looking backwards, I can see this flat valve that is created in this particular patient. And that is the anti-reflux barrier. Once again, that same location as we see in this first image here. 
Now, if someone does have a negative endoscopy and they're complaining of regurgitation, chest pain, dysphagia, or food impaction, this is when we get a manometry. And really what this is, is this is a very fancy tool to measure pressure along the length of the esophagus. Now, these tracings was the old way we did it, and now we have this much more intuitive way to do this, which we call esophageal pressure topography with high-resolution manometry. And with this now, we're able to see anatomy along with the pressure patterns. And the pressure signals are on this hot, cold scale. So if there is a red color, it's high pressure. If there's a blue color, there's low pressure. And by taking those images and looking at distinct patterns, we can actually dis define and classify esophageal motility disorders. And this is really important because we will treat patients based on some of these patterns. For instance, if you have achalasia, and you'll see here type 1 achalasia, you will actually get a treatment that will rely on uh, disrupting this lower esophageal sphincter so that we can open up that obstruction. Whereas if you have one of these disorders like jackhammer, or spasm, type 3 achalasia and spasm, we may give you a smooth muscle relaxant, which will relax the wall of the esophagus so it's not contracting and spasming as much. Now, as I mentioned, there's a lot of fancy algorithms that we use, but when we actually go through a manometry, this is actually the flow process that we think through when we make one of these diagnoses. And as I talked about, some of these diagnoses are actually diagnoses where you have an obstruction at the end of the esophagus, and others are actually diagnoses where you actually have uh, impaired propulsion, where the esophagus is not pushing the food and the liquid through the esophagus appropriately. Now, you don't have to really go through this, but this just gives you an idea of how we follow through the process of making these diagnoses. And then, of course, if we don't suspect motility and we're thinking that you have reflux disease, we'll actually put a little cap capsule um, here at the end of the esophagus, about five or six centimeters above that squamoclonar junction where the stomach and esophagus meet, and we'll measure your acid by looking at the pH in your esophagus over four days, over 96 hours. And what we find is this is a very useful test for us to decide whether or not you actually have reflux or you don't have reflux. And with this particular test, we can actually direct therapy. So if you don't have any reflux, we stop your proton pump inhibitor or take you off acid suppressive medicines. And then we start to think about other things, like can this be a functional disorder? Can we try neuromodulators, cognitive behavioral therapy? Or we also make sure we're not missing a motility disorder. But certainly if you have one or more days, we stratify how aggressive we're gonna be in terms of your acid um, suppression and your anti-reflux therapy, either increasing your acid dose or maybe even referring you for an endoscopic or surgical treatment for your reflux. Now, this is another more fancy tool that we use that uses a catheter we place down your nose where we can actually measure air and liquid reflux. And this is, in this example, this is actually the white color represents liquid refluxing up the esophagus. Now, this is a little bit more difficult in terms of for the patient because this requires a catheter down your nose. That other um, process was a capsule that was placed and you don't have a wire or a capsule out of your nose, so a little bit more comfortable. But this is a much more accurate way to define people who are not getting better with reflux. So if you have reflux and we know you have reflux, this is the test that we'll use to see why the medicines are not working. And we can look at all of these fancy parameters to see the reflux. We can look at air and the belching patterns. We can see whether there's rumination, where there's an effort, almost a, a subconscious um, effort to move stuff up from the stomach. A, a very difficult thing to diagnose sometimes, and sometimes you need these particular tests. This is a nice example of that high-resolution manometry again. Here's the upper sphincter, the lower sphincter, and the purple color is liquid moving up into the oral pharynx, and there's regurgitation here. This is an example of how we can diagnose something like rumination, which is where people subconsciously, um, although it is voluntary, um, bring up fluid and food into the mouth from the stomach by raising the intra-abdominal pressure and pushing it up. And once again, many patients don't even realize that they're actually doing this because it's a learned behavior and we can effectively treat this with diaphragmatic breathing. 
Now, also, many times we encounter patients who actually we initially think have an esophageal problem, but the problem is really more relegated to the throat area. And one of the more common things that we see is globus sensation, which is a lump in the throat. And once again, I show this algorithm just like I did for the esophagus, because as you can see, right after we take a good history and do a physical exam, the next step is really doing the laryngoscopy and endoscopy. And really what you're trying to do here is you're trying to look and make sure you're not missing anything. Here is a little cancer that you might miss. And, and once again, most people with a lump in the throat don't have cancer, but we really want to be careful. And that's why it's important for us to send you to a, um, an ENT doctor for that laryngoscopy. And if that's negative, we will try to treat you for reflux. And if you don't respond, we typically, once again, do an endoscopy. Now, really, when all of these tests are negative, so say, for instance, we see a patient with these esophageal or throat symptoms, the endoscopy, laryngoscopy is negative. There's no evidence of reflux or a motor disorder. That's when we really start to think about a functional bowel disorder. And this is really where we start to think about how patients' esophageal sensitivity um, interacts with their hypervigilance, their levels of anxiety, and really how does that affect their symptom perception and then their quality of life. And this is really a very cyclical process. And what we find is, is that we can actually break that cycle and address those hypersensitivity and that anxiety, that visceral anxiety, sometimes with what we call neuromodulators. Now, none of these neuromodulators are FDA approved for this. They're actually off label, but this is pretty much a very standard of care approach for various things like chest pain, refractory GERD and globus. But probably what I'm using a little bit more in my practice is really a focus on behavioral approaches, really using hypnotherapy and cognitive behavioral therapy to really divert patients' attention away from the symptoms and help them self-manage their symptoms and live a better quality of life. And I think that this has been a very instrumental part of my clinical practice. So in conclusion, the functional esophageal disorders really require us to go through this very thoughtful process where we look for problems with endoscopy, direct visualization. When we don't see something on direct visualization, we start to think about, okay, is this a physiology problem with motility or is this reflux? And if those are ruled out, that's when we start to recognize that visceral hypersensitivity, hypervigilance, and psychosocial stressors may be at play. And then we target our therapy towards these particular components. So with that, this is a very important slide because once again, it, it highlights the fact that this is a, a, a real problem focused on a real abnormality that can be addressed with neuromodulation and behavioral interventions. So thank you very much for your attention and I hope this was educational.